Um, we have a special guest this morning. Our friend, my neighbor, guy that I've known for a long time, Peter Roscom is the member of the U.S. House of Representatives from the 6th District, which is, if you're from Illinois, which is Barrington down to like Wheaton, Hinsdale, Burr Ridge, sort of like the, the ring around the western side of the city of Chicago. So Peter's been in Congress for 12 years. He was in the Illinois State Legislature before he uh, went to Washington. He currently proudly represents the 6th, and we're glad to have him. Um, he's also the chairman of the healthcare subcommittee in the Ways and Means Committee. So Peter is a guy that knows a lot about healthcare. He's also one of the guys that stuck his neck out and wrote a letter to Seema Verma at CMS and said, hey, take it easy on these campuses. That's a legitimate choice. You should look into this and let them pick where they want to live. So. And Peter didn't do that last week. He did this a year ago. And we've also used Peter's status to tell other members, hey, we, we think you should write that letter too and sign this letter and send it in. So we have letters from around the country going into the CMS with Peter's leadership. We're getting that done. So we're going to have comments here from Peter. He can only stay for about 20, 30 minutes maybe. And if you have any questions, we're going to try and stop at 20 minutes after. So again, like yesterday, if you have any questions, put them on the cards. We'll try and bring them up. But it's my distinct pleasure and my, this morning to introduce our friend, Peter Roscom. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks. All yours. Well, Brian, thank you very much, and Dana, for your invitation. Sister Rosemary, always a pleasure, and um, for all of you. And I think I, as I came in, I had a chance to meet with some of my constituents who are connected here to Misericordia, and I think my responsibility this morning is to encourage you. I am... Uh, Every time I've had the chance to visit Misericordia or to go to events and, and so forth, and there's a big group of families that are connected all throughout Chicagoland, and those of you who are from other parts of the country know this as well for the programs where you've got kids and, and loved ones. There's a lot of power in that connection. And it is, uh, every time I've been involved with Misericordia-related events, including just coming up here today, you kind of get drawn in based on the love that's here. And it is palpable, and you can just feel it, that you are motivated by the right things. You're motivated by advocating on behalf of people you love and you're close to. You're advocating on behalf of those whom you are called in some ways to, uh, to serve. And so I want to encourage you today. And I want to let you know that there are voices that are out there that are trying to echo and even trying to amplify these points that you're making. And I want to put this into a little bit of a, of a perspective for you. Brian mentioned that I chair the Health Subcommittee at the Ways and Means Committee, which is, means that from a legislative point of view, we're the group that has jurisdiction over CMS. We've got jurisdiction over Medicare in particular. Another House committee has jurisdiction over Medicaid. What's been interesting is we've put together an initiative on a bipartisan basis that is trying to go to healthcare providers and asking them a very interesting question. And think about this question in the context of the work that you're doing here. Here's the question. What are the regulations that just don't make any sense anymore? What are the regulations that are duplicative, that are overwhelming, that are burdensome, that are just, uh, that, that can be actually, they, they can be discouraging because it's busy work and it's nonsense and it doesn't go anywhere. Here's the thing. Oh, bless your heart. Um, that's what I call a mercy clap. That's what that was. Um, here's the thing. We've done this. I've got, we got both political parties coming together asking the same question. And the response that we've gotten from the healthcare community has been overwhelming. So we asked the question. And we went to physicians. We went to hospitals. We went to nursing homes. We went to rehabilitation facilities. And we got 500 responses back. And we've been slicing them and dicing them and organizing them and so forth. I'll just give you one. It's an anecdote, but it's an anecdote that you can relate to. Those of you from the Chicagoland, you know that one of our big health care providers here is Advocate. Advocate is headquartered in my constituency in Downers Grove. And I went and I met with their leadership a few months ago, and I posed that question to them. What are the regulations that don't make any sense? I could hardly ask the question before they were anticipating, and just off of the top of their head, they said, oh, Peter, we've got a story to tell you. And here was the story. CMS, federal government, came through on an, a tour of one of their hospitals, an inspection. 
And the CMS person went through and, you know, checked out chapter and verse, the whole place, and at the end told the leadership of the hospital, a hospital, by the way, any one of us would be pleased to be taken care of. Top drawer, great place. They told the leadership at the hospital, you've got a problem with your heating and your air conditioning system. And the leadership at the hospital said, no, we don't have a problem. This is the best, you know, this is the latest technology. We've got, you know, the, the, here's all the pamphlets and the brochures and all the catalogs and all the documentation for how good this HVAC system is. There's not a better one that's out there in the marketplace today. It's fantastic. And he goes, no, your problem is it doesn't meet the Medicare standard. In the interest of time, I'll collapse this down. They were forced to spend $1.5 million to move a shaft that had to be moved because it was 18 inches too close to something, who knows what. And to add insult to injury, you know what was out of date? The Medicare standard that had not been brought up to date to the current technology of what everybody else was using. Okay, so you take my point. Now think about that. That's one member of Congress asking one question, one day, one time, to one system, and that's off the top of their head, it's a million five. That's just them chatting me up with a million five. All right, so you take that experience and you overlay it onto the whole healthcare system, and you can see, you can see my point. Now here's the thing. This is why I want you to feel encouraged. I don't want you to feel lazy, but I want you to feel encouraged. There's a disposition right now at CMS, Medicare, that has, uh, that's very forward-leaning on trying to get regulations so that they do make sense. And you are right in the midst of that discussion. You are right in the midst of that sweet spot. Because what you are able to do demonstrably is to show hey, we're, uh, we're, we're meeting the goals of, of the residents of these facilities in ways that are transformational. We are getting this job done. We need to make sure more people have access to this. If this is what they want to do, it makes perfect sense. And we ought not be nickeled and dimed by a bunch of nonsense regulations that don't really make it safer. I'm not for, for, for a second saying we don't need regulations, and neither are you. But these ought to be regulations that make sense. And so CMS actually has initiative right now that we all need to take advantage of to move this choice issue ahead. Their initiative is called Patients Over Paperwork. So when I said we gave them 500 suggestions, they did get 500 suggestions from the Ways and Means Committee they're currently navigating through 3,000 of their own. And there is a disposition right now that says, let's, let's cut red tape, let's look at the bottom line, and you've got a great story to tell. You've got a story to tell that rivals everything. Because all you got to do is get people coming, all, you know, just, just walking through and just getting a sense of it. And the program, you're not selling, you're just telling the truth about what's going on. And I sense it. When parents are coming up to me, we had a little coffee earlier, parents are coming up to me and they're telling me about their children, telling me about Dan and telling me about Andrew, and there's a bunch of kids named Steven here, I've noticed. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, Kate and others, you know, people are telling me about their children and it is, there is a brightness as you're describing this. There is a joy as you're describing this. And you can't compete with that. All the bureaucracy and all the reports and all the nonsense cannot compete with the joy with which you're communicating. And it's almost infectious. And so what you need to do right now is, number one, to be mindful of that. Number two, to make sure that you're continuing to talk with one another, and that's what you're doing. You're building a constituency. You're building a network. You're building voices that are out there. And number three, you've got to keep pressing on. And so I will do my best to be talking about you with other, uh, with other members of Congress and others in the administration with whom I'm interacting, and I consider that my obligation to you. And it's a duty, but it's an easy duty to take up. I mean, you're not asking me to be OJ's lawyer here. You know what I mean? You're asking me to advocate on behalf of a really, really great program, and I'm happy to do that. But I think also we've got to be continuously infectious about us talking about this 
to other people. And I think you'd be surprised at the number of people that really are interested, um, that, that, are, that are rooting for you in a way, because they know, that, they know the, the burden that you're carrying. And I don't mean that your children are a burden. What I mean is the things that they're dealing with are challenging. And so the, people recognize that. And they also recognize that there's a, a cumulative effort that we ought to come alongside one another and help take on some of that responsibility. And sometimes, people don't know quite how to take on that responsibility. They'll come to stuff, they'll come to fundraisers and, and other things, but if they got the sense that there's a way for them to advocate on behalf of someone that they know, someone that they love, someone that they have a connection with, and that that advocacy can make itself manifest in a policy that helps them, they would be only too happy to do it but they've got to be told, they've got to understand, they've got to know the connection that, that reaching out to a member of Congress is not just check a box, but there's a real person that's, that's connected with this. So I think um, if you're looking for unsolicited advice, my unsolicited advice would be to lay out a strategy to intentionally get in front of members of Congress across the country, to intentionally get them on campus, and to think about that strategically. And I think that if that happens, then we could see some, some real transformation. And so now is the season to get that done. Um, there's an administration that is at least open for business in terms of a deregulatory regime and a, a willingness to try and revisit things that were, uh, you know, uh, that, that other groups may have been unwilling to do. So um, I just want to let you know it's a real joy for me to be here. It's, a, it's encouraging for me to be among you, and I look forward to our paths continuing to cross. We both have work to do, and um, I will carry on that work, as I said, reaching out to other members as we're, we're looking for a legislative vehicle um, through which we can accomplish this task. And, and I guess the last word is just remember, we're, we're the good guys on this issue. We're the, we're the people that are saying, hey, everybody's, you know, not, one size does not fit all. And that's pretty intuitive, by the way. We don't believe in other aspects of our life that one size fits all. And what you're saying and what you're advocating is one size doesn't fit all. And we need to make sure that as family members are navigating through and are thinking things through, that they've got as much choice and as many options as they possibly can. That's in sync with who we are as a people in so many other aspects of our lives. And we're not asking anybody to go counter to that. And we've got good protections in place. And beyond good protections in place, we've got a program that is transformational and life-giving and encouraging to the residents and encouraging to the families that are a part of it. So, sister, it's always fun to be with you, and um, I'm happy to answer easy questions that make me look good. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you very much. Oh, it wasn't too bad. So uh, 6.45, I left Wheaton, Illinois, and uh, we, were, we were up here. Uh, this is not an easy place to get, sister, uh, but, uh, but well worth the drive, my friend. So yeah, it wasn't too tough. So here's the first yeah. question. Uh, what's the best way to get members to hear us? Email, letter, visits, calls. So members, meaning members of Congress. Um, here's the thing. Life is relationships, isn't it? It's relationships. And be intentional about building relationships and be intentional about um, connecting with people. So by example, uh, after college, I kind of, on a lark, I moved down to the Virgin Islands and I taught high school. <laughs> it was a good life, can I just tell you that? So I'm teaching high school in St. Thomas and I'm 23 years old and all of a sudden, it's wintertime in Chicago, and all of a sudden, I'm finding myself very popular among my friends. Like, hey, Peter, hey, man, how's it going? We'd love to, uh, how, you know. So I ended up just being avalanched with all these visitors. And I, I knew these guys, but there were a couple of rascals that were just kind of mooching off me, and it was pretty obvious. Here's my point. You don't want to be the mooch. You want to be the person that's in touch with your representative before you need them before you need her to go and write a letter for you. 
before you need her to advocate for you and so forth. Because if it's not this issue, it's going to be another issue, and it's going to be another issue. So this relationship is very, very significant. I know Misericordia has done a good job here of reaching out, building a constituency with state, legislate, state legislators, many of whom, like me, end up in the U.S. House and so forth. And uh, I think the first time I came through, I was in the Illinois General Assembly, I think. And um, so relationships, getting to, getting to know people. And, and elected officials are happy to, I mean, this is what we do. So we're happy to connect. We're happy to learn about things. So I would say just the relationship of, of getting to know people. Number two, emails, yeah, that's okay. But, you know, there's a lot of sort of inbound stuff. Getting in front of people, visiting them, is, is, is the best thing. And um, think about any other, any other level of, of connection. So since that's my question of the day, I'll yeah. follow on for a second. So when I call Peter Rossman's office, sometimes I don't get you, I get Hannah, you're L.A. So <laughs> can you describe what her job is and like specifics? If you're not, are you getting put off if you come to the L.A.? No. So don't be put off by uh, staff. And don't be put off by young staff. So Capitol Hill is a pretty young place by and large. There's a lot of 20-somethings that are running around there. And many of these young people are very skilled. They've become very expert in certain areas. And um, they're relied upon. And they're really sort of gatekeepers and, and um, uh, information gatherers. And they've got opinions and so forth. So in my, in my office, there's a, a young gal who grew up locally here in Hoffman Estates. Her name is Hannah Shargan, and Hannah handles all things healthcare in my office, and she's, um, and I listen to her, because she's taking the time to go through in detail, read the reports, read the letter, track the legislation, and so forth. So you'll have any number of people who have this responsibility, so um, don't, don't let their youth, uh, don't let their youth fool you. They have a lot of a lot of influence. Yep. Um, do I have interaction with Kathy McMorris Rogers? She has a young son with Down syndrome. Yes, I do. So um, Kathy has been part, and there are several other members of Congress who have kids with disabilities that are significant, and um, they were a big part of the ABLE Act and expanding the ABLE Act that, that we were able to uh, uh, move through in, in the big tax reform effort. And Kathy was a big part of that. And there are other members as well. And so she's a leading, she's a leading voice. Um, how effective is it for organizations to do Days on the Hill? It matters. So I know it's a hassle to schlep out there and go through the metal detectors and, and all that sort of stuff. But it matters. Your physical presence matters. Because if you, I'll tell you this. If you're not present, then everybody assumes, oh, they're fine. They don't care. You know, like, whatever. It's just human nature. So it's not dispositive. It's not the only thing you need to do. It's not, this is like anything else, it's not just show up once a year, but your willingness to come out, and it's demonstrable to people. Hey, these are, these are real people that are coming in from all over the country to talk to their elected representatives. They're taking a lot of time and a lot of effort, and the expense is not insignificant, and they're willing to do it. Let's, let's hear them out and show them the respect that they deserve based on that. So it's, it's a significant thing. Um, what can we do to keep our issue in the forefront? Um, sometimes things are news driven. You know, it, it can be, um, you know, just, uh, I mean, you're being very kind to me right now and that most of you are looking at me. And, um, but if you're not, you're just so tempted to look at your news feed and to flick through stuff. And uh, listen, and I'm not calling anybody out, by the way. Um, <laughs> But it's, it's, my, my point is, the news stuff moves super quick. I mean, ridiculously quick. And I would say, be mindful of the news cycle and stories that the country is generally focusing on and seeing if there's a way to appropriately bring attention to yourselves and what you're trying to do. It's sort of a, um, it's a little higher level math there, but, but you take my point. So one thing is to take advantage of the news and to tell a story based on the news, and, um, and there's an opportunity there. The other is to be tenacious, to be uh, uh, just, just never-ending. 
And I think that there's a lot of wisdom there. And we know in other aspects of our lives that tenacity works, sales works, physical presence works, um, getting things repeated works. And as a result, you, you, you should be in, encouraged to do that. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Other than our district representatives and state senators, who are the elected officials who, who are most likely to help us in, our, in, in a position to help? Um, I would say they're people that are not elected but that are appointed in various administrations. So health department officials at a state level and obviously the Department of, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services at a federal level. The bureaucracies there are significant and many people are come through a political process, obviously, and, and they get appointed to these positions. And that's a good thing, I would argue, because that's many times it's relationship driven and they, they've, they've been active and they have now find themselves in positions of authority that's appointed based on a political process. And there's another group entirely, and these are professionals who, who are part of a bureaucracy and, and grow up in a bureaucracy bureaucracy. That's a harder group in my experience to influence based on sort of the, the structures of government. So I would say um, to be mindful is a funny business. Um, there, there's a senior official at the U.S. Uh, Health and Human Services Department who's got a lot of authority right now and you know three years ago he's minding his own business doing something completely else, uh, completely different in, in, in politics and now he finds himself there. And so you take my point that you want to just continually be building a stronger and stronger cons uh, constituency and basically an ecosystem of advocates on your behalf. Speaking of uh, appointed officials, who yeah. did you send yesterday to? Well, that was Doug O'Brien. That's who I'm telling, who's a, who's a big deal at HHS. <laughs> um, this week uh, we heard about possible Medicaid cuts. How scared should we be about block grants or cuts? Um, there's a lot of hyperbole, particularly this time of year. Um, my mother is 88 years old, and she lives locally, and I'm involved in a re-election campaign. And I told my mom, after Labor Day, don't turn the television on. You just don't want to see it. <laughs> November 7th, flick it back on. So bless her heart, she's renting videos at the library. So, um, uh, so there's a lot of, th there's a lot of uh, palpable anxiety based on TV ads and this, that, and the other thing that's, that's all across the country. Here's where I think the overwhelming majority of, of people really are. And that is to say, you are part, you are advocating on behalf of a constituency that is widely supported in this country, broadly supported. And there's really nobody that's saying, oh, you know what? You know the, the, the group of people that should be on their own? It's, it's this group of people. There's nobody that's, really, that, that's saying that. The question then becomes, all right, how do you update programs to make them m more workable? How do we, you know, take, take the example of the hospital that I mentioned. You got an old Medicare rule that's ridiculous. Are there Medicaid rules that are ridiculous? Are there other old Medicare rules that are ridiculous? So anytime people are proposing any sort of changes, um, the, the, the folks who don't want to see any change will, will in my experience is, uh, there's a great temptation to be hyperbolic about it and to completely overreact. So I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say that there's, a, that there's an effort that you need to be concerned about, but you gotta be mindful. I mean, anytime there are changes, let's, be, let's make sure that they're smart changes and that they're changes that ease up on the pressure on uh, places like Misericordia and other campuses around, around the country. And let's make sure that we're giving as much flexibility as we possibly can. So I just wanna let you know, I appreciate very much the invitation and the chance to be here. Uh, those of you who are visiting Chicagoland, uh, we're delighted that you're here. This really is a crown jewel for the region and those of us who are from the Chicago area are really proud of Misericordia and the reputation that it enjoys and it's a well-deserved reputation. And so we hope that your time here is fruitful and profitable and uh, again, thanks very much.